All right. Yeah. So good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the fourth session already for this Terroir series webinar. For those of you re-watching the video or listening to the audio later, uh, glad to have you guys. We have a guest tonight, Jessica Moseiko from Edfield, and she will talk about her wine and uh, her project. And we'll be tasting this Oregon Pinot Noir to later compare against the Burgundy one. Okay, so um, glad to have you all. So I think we should uh, get started, and you know, people will join eventually. I know some people are uh, watching the video later, but yeah, guys, again, if you're watching this, we will taste uh, the Oregon Pinot Noir first, and then the Burgundian uh, Pinot Noir later. So just prepare the wines, pour into your wine glasses so you can compare and contrast. I have uh, everything ready right now, okay? All right, and please, um, you can send questions through the chat box or um, the Q&A. Uh, if you wanna make comments and questions, please send to everyone so everyone can see, not only the host and panelists, and I'm gonna share the presentation so we can get started. All right, so just confirming you can see both me, Jessica, and um, the presentation. Okay, let me see the chat box in here. Okay, so yes, okay. Neil says yes, Yulian as well, yes. So, okay, so. Welcome to Tehoar Matters. Uh, this webinar series uh, today is session number four. So, you know, finally to Pinos, really excited to have you all here. Thank you all for joining and for, you know, always the good questions and comments. Um, so again, my name is Alessandra Steves. I'm a master of wine candidate, director of wine education for Florida Wine Academy. By this time, you all know me. I don't need to introduce myself. Um, but we have a guest in here tonight, and I'm really excited. So, Jessica Moseiko, welcome to our webinar at Florida Wine Academy. Really glad to have you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about what you do and your qualifications uh, that we see on the slide as well. Sure, absolutely. Uh, very briefly, I... Um, really have no qualifications in wine, meaning that my past career was in biotechnology. And, um, but uh, when I was a kid growing up, my father, who was a software engineer, had a hobby of making wine just for fun out of our backyard vineyard and making wine in the garage. And I grew up always helping him. After he had done that for 20 years, he called me at my job in biotechnology in San Francisco and said, so I, I think we should start a winery. And I said, that's a great idea, dad, you should go do that. And he said, well, I'd, I'd really want a partner. And so we co-founded the winery together in 2003. Um, we made wine together until he passed away in 2017. And now I'm the sole owner um, making wines that I hope are inspired by his legacy and my daughter's future. So to be clear, everything that I've learned about wine and about winemaking is by doing it over the course of the past 20 years. Um, so I say that I've learned it by making mistakes and by just hands-on experience and learning from my dad. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so, so yes, I, I also did change careers. So I was a former attorney. And nowadays I'm a wine educator, wine buyer. Um, so yes, there is. We're, you know. Yeah, we're recovering corporate types. We were like part of the great resignation until it was before it was a thing. Right, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Okay, so really happy to have you. And you know, I know Jessica will talk more about uh, the company later and their philosophy and what they do. So um, just, you know, session four is Pinot Noir Burgundy versus Oregon one. So what we are going to do in here is just, you know, recap a little bit what we saw until now. Uh, then we are really going to understand what is the Oregon terroir with Jessica. Um, and then, you know, I'm going to talk about the Burgundy terroir and we'll do the tasting of the two wines that you guys have. Okay. 
So um, starting a little bit of recap. So remember session one, we saw, you know, what is terroir? And of course it is the soil, the topography, the climate, but you know, might include viticulture and winemaking as well, okay? We also looked at blending, how this blending can create complexity and balance. But remember, blending can be done in the vineyard as well. You know, cloning is a thing. And, and you know, I'm excited to, to talk about that tonight as well. Um, for the reasoning session, we talked about how to make sweet wines, you know, stopping the fermentation, adding a sweet concentrated, botrytis, ice wine. So if you missed that session, go ahead and you know watch the recording. And then Finally, you know, what has been very interesting in all these sessions is this comparison between old world and new world, right? So from old world wine, we do expect a more savory, dry, with higher acidity and lower alcohol. It is not always like this, you know, some vintage variation happens. In the new world, um, the wines appear to be plusher, softer, with a moderate acidity and higher alcohol. But now we know that all depends on the climate as well. So this is not always true, but it can be true for some of the grapes most of the time, okay? Okay, so for this session, we are going to look into Pinot Noir, okay? So in here, I did put the major plantings for Pinot Noir. That is the book of Oz Clark um, as of 2015. So you see the France is, you know, the main country for it. 31,000 hectares. And, you know, after France, California is the largest one. So I didn't expect that um, to have, you know, that amount of Pinot Noir. And then, you know, the region uh, within France, Champagne is the largest region for Pinots. And then it comes Germany and Burgundy with 10,000 hectares. Okay. So still Chardonnay is the most planted grape variety in Burgundy. Now, Italy comes next, which is, you know, we barely drink, consume, hear about Italian Pinot Noir. I know it is a, used a lot in the, you know, method of classical wines. Think Franciacorta, think, you know, Trento Doc, now Prosecco Rosé is using Pinot Noir too. And then we have New Zealand and, you know, Oregon comes last in here with only 5,000 hectares. So if you compare Oregon to Burgundy, it is half the size. If you compare to California, it is one third of the size, which is quite, you know, dramatically. Uh, but, you know, Oregon is very well known for the Pinot Noir. So that means that even with, you know, that amount of hectares, they are doing a great job. So the word know them as um, one of the main regions for Pinot Noir in the world, okay? And, and talking a little bit about, you know, viticulture and winemaking for Pinot. So Pinot does better in cool climates, okay? In hot climates, Pinot can be jammy and kind of lose the freshness and elegance. So we want to have, um, you know, Pinot Noir coming from cool climates. Pinot is very notorious for the clonal variation, okay? So every time you talk to a winemaker or wine producer, they always mention clones for Pinot Noir, which I think it is uh, very interesting. Um, and then, you know, in the winery, people talk a lot about destemmed fruit versus whole bunch. And, um, and you know, winemakers have different reasons for that. We, we can explore a little bit more of that, you know, as we go. Um, some people say, you know, brings um, spicy or floral characteristics, others use it for the tannins, so other uses just because it is more practical to destem everything and easier to take care of the, the fruit like this. Um, another thing that is used with Pinot is cold soak, okay, so you need to extract color. Pinot Noir is a thin skin variety, so that means, you know, it doesn't extract color automatically. So you need to, to do a cold soak and then, you know, kind of um, during fermentation, move this fruit around so you can extract some color. Fermentation vessels, you know, can be doing inert vessels like stainless, um, stainless steel tanks, large oak uh, vats as well. So all of this is possible. And aging in oak uh, is also done with um, Pinot Noirs, but a careful use. Nobody will use, you know, heavily toasted barrels or 200% new oak barrels like they do um, with Napa Cabernet Sauvignon, okay? 
there was something, you know, on the media a few, I want to say years ago, saying the carbonization of Pinot Noir, which was precisely that. You're trying to, you know, extract too much or put too much oak, and then you lose the beauty and the elegance of the grape, okay? So this is kind of a panorama of the grape before we dive into the regions. So yes, look for the cool climate, you know, winemaking techniques, they are as simple as possible, nothing too complicated with Pinot. Pinot is complicated in the vineyard, that is, that is true. So, and then, you know, without any further ado, I wanna, uh, Jessica, to guide us through Oregon Pinot. Excellent, thank you, Alessandra. So first, I just wanna say, when we talk about Oregon Pinot Noir, that I wanna um, build off of what Alessandra said. We're tiny but mighty. So as you saw, we produce a very small amount, half of what Burgundy produces, a third of what California produces. Another way to look at that, at that is that Oregon produces only 1.5% of domestic wine that is produced in the United States, only 1.5%. Yet we, um, that, it, that encapsulates over 20% of wine spectator scores over 90. So I am not saying that wine, specter, wine spectator is the arbiter of taste or quality, but if we want to look at a marker, that seems to me well, producing 1.5% but greater than 20% seems to be an indicator of potential quality. Another um, way of looking at that is that Oregon wine has been growing at roughly three times the growth rate in wine sales than US wine sales overall. So why is that? I think that there are sort of four main reasons and we're gonna talk about that tonight. One is simply the premiumization of wine buying in general and the increase in um, the categories that Oregon plays in, specifically Pinot Noir, Chardonnay and sparkling wine and rosé. Um, but I think another component is that what we're gonna talk about, which is climate. And um, Oregon, has the Willamette Valley specifically, has a climate that is very similar to Burgundy. Um, we'll be talking about that a little bit, but one way to categorize climate is through the Winkler Index, um, which essentially category, categorizes, we measure everything in growing degree days, and the Winkler An Index categorizes regions based on what is the average amount of growing degree days that they cumulatively see on average in a growing season and categorize that into different levels. Both Oregon and, excuse me, the Willamette Valley and Burgundy are both level one, which means a cool climate. That's in, com in uh, contrast to say Sonoma, which is a level three. So I think that there's still, you know, Alessandra just said, cool, Pinot Noir tends to grow better in cool climates. And I think that that's one component of a reason why we're seeing Willamette Valley and Oregon growth rates as we are. Um, the third is soil variation, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And then the last is that we are predominantly made up of producers that are small. So 75% of producers in the Willamette Valley produce less than 5,000 cases a year. What that means is that rather than having a lot of large quantity players, you have a lot of small quality players, um, which can mean that there is an attention to detail that may be possible, not to say that it's not possible in the large producer, but I think that it's not common to see 75, in the United States, it's not common to see 75% occurring at that level. So that's a little bit of the why. When we talk about kind of our geography, thanks. So what you see is that within Oregon, the Willamette Valley runs about 100 miles down from the top, which is where Portland is, down the Willamette River. And it is 60 miles across at its widest point. It's located about 50 miles inland from the coast. And we'll talk about why that is relevant in a moment. But what I would say is that there's about 30,000 planted acres of which 75% of which is Pinot Noir. Um, 
And in terms of numbers, there are 931 vineyards at last count and 736 wineries. What I want to say about the 736 wineries is that when we started in 2003, we were about the 150th winery. So you're talking about a very um, on one hand, we're mature. The first vines were planted 57 years ago in the valley. However, there's been a tremendous amount of growth within the course of the past 20 years. Um, the last thing I would say about that is that we were recently recognized by the uh, European Union as a protected geographic indicator. Um, indication, which is kind of a marker of quality, we're the first region besides Napa to be uh, recognized in the United States. That's amazing. So Thank you for sharing the statistics, the numbers and everything. I'm writing it down because um, so, so many good numbers and comments in here. Oh, and please, if there are questions, please throw them in the chat um, because I, I know I'm kind of moving quickly. So just, just stop me if you have any questions. So when we talk about what makes the Willamette Valley unique, um, in the definition that you had of uh, terroir, Alessandra, I want to focus on two elements, the climate and the soil. So climate, first of all, when we're talking about climate, obviously we're not talking about day-to-day -day weather patterns. We're talking about what you would expect given the historical averages. And there are four main components of climate that make the Willamette Valley unique. The first is sunshine, the second is wind, the third is rain and the fourth is temperature. So when I'm talking about sunshine, so we are located at about the 48th um, degree parallel. Um, so what that means is that we, first of all, we often say we're at the similar latitude as Burgundy, which is true, but within the United, uh, sorry, within North America, we're actually closer to say Montreal um, and Toronto than we are what you would think, which would be on the New York plane. Um, so what that means is that we have a large, a large amount of growing degree uh, sorry, sorry, large number of hours of sunshine during our peak growing season. So during our peak growing season, we have about 16 hours a day of sunshine versus I'm going to tell you, it's pretty depressing in December when it's about eight hours of sunshine a day. But why that matters to the grapes is that that's exactly when they need it. That's exactly when they need that sunshine to get some of that fruit forward characteristics, that maturation, that fruit development. So it tends to be concentrated in that growing season. And by the way, when I say growing season, in the Willamette Valley, that typically means um, a six month growing season that starts with bud break on average in the middle of April. That's why when we were getting started, Alessandra, I said, we're seeing a little bit of bud break at the lower elevations, but I don't have it near me yet. So it's kind of happening in, over the course of the next week or two, probably. And that progresses through usually um, fruit, uh, fruit set and bloom around, you know, June-ish. Verizon usually occurs July, July, August. And harvest on average usually happens in October. That has crept up a bit over the course of the last 10 years or so, but that's an average six month growing season. So number one, we have the sunshine factor. Um, and number two, we are located, remember when we saw that map, we're located about 50 miles inland from the coast. We are located in between two wind corridors. So we have a corridor coming up from the coast that is called the Van Duzer Corridor that brings very cooling winds in. We also have a cooling wind influence coming down the Columbia River Gorge, which separates Oregon and Washington. And we sit right in between in the, you know, kind of the, the crest of that. What that means is that the wind really lowers temperatures quite a bit so that while you have the nice sunshine during the day, which will help fruit development, flavor development, alcohol, um, or sugar development, you have a lot of cooling influences that can really help us retain acidity. That is related to factor number four, which is the temperature shift. And so we have um, yeah. the question. So is the wind seasonal or do you have it all year? All year long. Okay. Yeah, all year long. Um, 
And so the, we, we have what's considered a large diurnal shift. So when I say diurnal shift, I mean the delta or the difference between our peak daytime temperature and our nighttime temperature. So in our region, a typical example is that an average during the June to August timeframe is 79 degrees during the day, 50 degrees during the, um, during the night. So you're talking about a 30 degree shift, which is lovely for acids. Um, so I think that's one other component. The only thing I would say about rain is that we see on average, I know this is gonna sound horrendous to you, but we see on average about 39 inches annually. However, that is less than one inch per month in our peak growing season. So all of that rain that Oregon has such a, such a solid reputation for <laughs> is very concentrated, not in the growing season. And so what that means is we have a lot of root saturation, um, particularly for these older vines that can access that moisture, but we don't have a lot of um, the problems that, that, that can come with that. So, that's what I would say about our climate. And, and Jessica, just to, to let you know, you know, I'm loving this because I talked about Wankler before. I talked oh, okay. about you know, rain in all the regions. So okay. yeah, tell, you're giving the me. perfect compliment <laughs> to everything. So, yeah. Or if it's repetitive, just tell me, keep moving. No, 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 you're perfect. It is a new region for us to study. Yeah. So we have three major soil types in the area. Of course, there's 50 million subtypes, but these are the three major soil types. Have you already talked about these soil types? Okay, so uh, the first and quote oldest of the soil types is, and this is all based on the geology of the area, of course. So uh, 50 million years ago, all of Oregon, or at least Western Oregon, was underwater. So tectonic plates shifted and it elevated uh, the, the Western Oregon region, which then formed the coastal range and the Cascade Range, which are the two mountains that buttress the Willamette Valley. So you can, uh, so in other words, parts of the valley were underwater at some point. So at some of our higher elevation sites, this is marine sedimentary soil. And marine sedimentary soil, um, is characterized as being very well draining, um, which means the roots have to struggle a bit. And it is also very poor nutrient. There's not a lot of minerals in that soil. So what that means is that the vines again have to struggle. So what you might expect from marine sedimentary soil, uh, also called commonly called Willikensia, or that's the most common type that we have in the valley, um, is that those are more uh, like darker black fruit, either rich red fruit or dark black fruit, blue fruit, um, usually a bit grippier on the tannins, um, a bit more intense. The second oldest, which is 15 million years old, is volcanic soil or basalt soil. And how that came to pass was that a series of volcanic eruptions came down, which formed the Columbia River Gorge, um, ultimately from, um, from Montana, and brought that all down through the valley. So what you see there, and you can even see it in this, this slide here, see how that's kind of a more deeper red color? These are, um, more moisture retaining soils, and they're very high in nutrients, specifically iron, which is why it looks more um, rich and kind of dark red in that photo. And so what that means is that the vines do not have to struggle as much. And so these tend to be um, wines that are a bit uh, lighter in its fruit structure, so more lighter red fruits definitely has a little bit of minerality to it usually, a um, little bit of spice notes. And these are, this is most commonly found in Jory soil, also Nakaya. Um, the Dundee Hills is most commonly uh, where you might expect to find volcanic soils and Shehala Mountains. Whereas for marine sedimentary, that's really Yamhill Carlton district and um, to Shehill Mountains a little bit and Ribbon Ridge. The last soil type is windblown silt or loess soil type. Uh, our most common is, is um, laurel wood that we have here. 
And that was formed about a million years ago. So the idea is that uh, winds came up, kind of kicked the soil over. These tend to be, um, oh, I will say that when I'm telling you what the, the structure is or what the profile is, that is informed not only by my personal experience, but in Oregon, we also have something called um, Oregon Pinot Camp, which um, Alessandra, you're probably familiar with, that we bring a lot of um, wine professionals from the trade out to Oregon for an intensive. And over the years, we've done a lot of blind tastings of these different soil types and have categorized what those, those personality types or what the profiles are of these three soil types. And I will say that in, in Windblown loess tends to be a little bit more nebulous, but it tends to have both the red and dark fruit structure, a bit more spice notes, um, smooth tannins. So that's a little bit about what I think makes the Willamette Valley unique. What this all means is that you might expect some, um, you know, I would say fruit forwardness, suppleness, but, and I'm speaking in gross generalizations, of course, um, but more moderate alcohol levels and moderate acidity levels. And because of the soil variation, you might expect to see some complexity in our blends and some variety in the overall lineup that you see from the Willamette Valley. Yeah, I like that. Okay. So then briefly about AFI, who are we? Um, so AFI means and daughter, and it's named that because my father and I co-founded the winery, as I told you in 2003. Um, you know, our goal is to make wines that are, you know, bring together family, friends, and warm conversation over shared meals. People always ask me what my winemaking style is. I can't tell you what my style is. I can tell you what my aspiration is. My aspiration is that, you know, I believe that wine should be exactly like life, well-lived, which is authentic, complex, and balanced. And I believe that my job as the winemaker is to honor place and time that it comes from and to allow that wine, I mean, that's the beauty of wine, isn't it? That we can kind of always in the same moment be fully present in the moment while thoughtful about what came before it and the history and the vintage, and also thinking about what's going to come next and how that wine's going to evolve. So th that's sort of my goal. We're tiny, we're about 2,500 to 3,000 cases per year. Um, and again, I, I really am trying to make wines that are inspired by my dad's legacy and my daughter's future. And let me just look, Neil, um, where do our vines originally come from? So, okay, so uh, you know what? I think I skipped over. I was being so quick about um, trying to pack things in that I forgot the vineyard map of where our vineyards are. So let me just tell you. Um, I have a small, oh no, it's okay. Oh, oh yeah, that's perfect. That's great, thank you. Um, so I have a small state vineyard that my dad planted on our property. It's now the property where I live. So basically it's the house I grew up in. And then what, just side note, it's the house I grew up in. And then my dad, um, I used to always say to him, listen, I know that this is the house you, you know, your dream house, but just so you know, after you guys die, I'm selling the house because there's no way I'm ever going to live out there. Well, after my dad died, I said, mom, we need to get you into a more manageable house. And she said, nope, I'm never going anywhere. So my daughter and I moved in here. So now I'm living in the same house that I grew up in and I am now planting the rest of our property. So at the time that we moved, so we have a small test vineyard here. And at the time that we planted it in the mid eighties at a thousand feet, it was considered too high to plant Pinot Noir um, because the optimal range has always been considered 200 to 800 feet. However, due to the changes that we've seen in the last 10 years, I now believe that um, a thousand feet is no problem. And so I'm in the process of, of planting the rest of it. But anyway, so I have three vineyards, but in addition to that, I work with six sites. So I have three vineyards that are located in the Yamhill Carlton district, which is in that kind of that orangish peach color on the west side. Um, sorry, no, up, uh, up a little. Yep, there you go. 
three vineyards there. I have two vineyards that are in the mauve color, the Dundee Hills, right to the west, uh, sorry, east of where we just were. Yep, exactly. Two vineyards there. And then one down in the Eola Amity Hills. So those are the six sites. I'm actually in the process of growing and expanding now. So I have some new vineyards coming that of the wines that we're trying now, that's where they come from. Um, and I would just say that, you know, we're committed to sustainable winemaking community and diversity and equity. And it's a matter of, because I'm inspired by um, my, our legacy and my daughter's future, I have to be focused on the future. So, you know, people always ask me, how old is your daughter? Is she going to come into the business? She's six and a half. I have no idea. But what I can say is that it informs what I do and why we do it, because I really believe that it is our, you know, as a winery, we are totally dependent on our land, our seasons, and our community. It is our responsibility to leave those all in a better place for the next generation. Um, so when I say sustainable winemaking, just to be clear about, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I mean that I work only with sustainable vineyards, which means that they are either live certified, which is the certification. Um, and, and it's so confusing because there's different certifications for like all these different regions, but that's ours in Oregon and or they are farmed organically and or biodynamically. Um, so that's what I mean, number one. It also means that I try to be very thoughtful about the packaging, um, packaging in uh, predominantly locally sourced, lighter weight glass, eliminating the use most recently of non-sustainable unnecessary things like I'm not using capsules on most of my wines anymore. Um, so that's what I mean by sustainable winemaking. Uh, by community, it just means that I'm focused on um, raising awareness and funds for with cause driven wines. And diversity and equity, I'm, I have a biracial background, I recognize that um, I try to support suppliers and also customers that um, have come from underrepresented communities, where we were recently certified as a B Corp. Um, so that's a big commitment that we have. Amazing. So the wine that we're tasting today is the 2017 Willamette Valley Pinot Noir. Um, and I'm going to talk as you're as you start tasting it, um, I will just start telling you a couple of winemaking side notes about it. And that way you can share with me what kind of your 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 experience of it is. So obviously it's 100% Pinot Noir. Actually, I want to comment on that. I say obviously it's 100% Pinot Noir, but I want to say that that is not necessarily always obvious. Alessandra, have you already talked about this? Well, we did talk a little bit about, you know, how some places you can have the 75% rule, other places yeah. exporting to Europe is the 85% rule. And I think I mentioned that Oregon is 95%, especially if you are within the AVA, correct? Yeah, that's right. And I'm part of a group that's trying to get it, that was trying to push it to 100%. And um, uh, we, we didn't win that fight, but we will in the future. Um, because I, I just, we, there's a lot of us that really believe firmly that if you say, you know, we don't have that for, for I don't know, uh, meat, you know, or zucchini, we don't buy a zucchini and think it's like 95% zucchini. So anyway, um, but I say 100% Pinot Noir is obvious. Anyway, um, we, I will say that I have within the Willamette Valley, the, the quote unquote oldest uh, clones were Pomard and Badensville clones. And then later in, I believe it was the early 90s, um, there were a series of Dijon clones that came out of UC Davis, and the reason they became very popular very early was because they were meant to be earlier ripening. And as a zone one cool climate, early ripening is quite attractive. Um, so there were a lot of different, and so whenever you see three numbers together, it's usually a Dijon clone. It could be 777667114115, you get the point. Um, I will say that we have, or I have a very strong preference for the Pomard and Bainesville clone. Um, I do work with a few other Dijon clones, and in this case, it's the 777. Um, 
So we do all small lot fermentation, which means they come in 1.5 to 1.9 ton um, uh, fermentation lots. I always cold soak unless it's a vintage that I don't think that it's appropriate to do so, which means that I see any risk of botrytis or microbial activity. Um, in 2017, my recollection is that I did think, so 2017 as a vintage, we had an extremely warm, it was a late ripening year. Um, bud break did not occur until, I wanna say it was the third or fourth week of, of April. It was late for us. And um, so we had a late start, but then it was very hot over the summer, a lot of, days over 90. Have you talked about what that means, days over 90? No. So have. days over 90, so vines, at least in the Willamette Valley, vines shut down over 90 degrees. And so what that means is that it sort of, it's almost like a neutralization of that growing degree days because the vines shut down and they're, they're not doing anything. So anyway, we had a lot of um, days over 90, it was very warm, but then right at harvest, we had a lot of rain. What that lot of rain means is that I believe that the 2017 vintage, while it was a warm vintage, presents itself as a more cooler vintage. Um, I believe Josh Reynolds, Vinius called the vintage classic Oregon Pinot elegance. Um, so anyway, we had rain at harvest, and so I can think of in one vineyard in particular, uh, I was not comfortable with the cold soak, so we didn't do that um, in that case. Um, we age, it, I want to talk about inoculation. I do a combination of spontaneous fermentation and inoculation. Um, I happen to not have a position about that. I know in recent years, there's been a, um, a lot of talk about uh, poo-pooing, um, inoculating. I happen to believe that if you know what you're striving for and you know your site very well, um, it can be quite an advantage. Um, so, and we age entirely in French oak barrels for 10, 11 months. Um, the Willamette Valley is kind of our, our entry level Pinot Noir, which means we do not winter it over. Um, and so, yeah, that's a little bit about how it was made. Yeah, no, very, very good. So for the cloning then, um, you choose that site specifically or you choose really to give more complexity because, you know, also they will be different, the fruit will be different and therefore you're creating complexity from the vineyard on. Site specific, but uh, well, both site specific and also, well, I think of our wines as um, a portfolio and I think of it as we need to have, we need to, my job is to be true to the site and the vintage. Within that, I would like to have some variation within there. Um, I choose them both for different reasons. Pomard I choose because I like the texture in general of Pomard. Um, I, I just like the mouthfeel. Vainsville, I tend to like the aromatics of it. A little bit more floral notes. Um, and the Dijon clones, I usually like for a little bit more structure. So I would say that the reason is to add some layers or to help with complexity across the portfolio. And what about whole cluster or distilled wow. fruits? Where are you in that? I love whole cluster, only in warm vintages. So I'll tell you in 2017, I'm trying to remember. In 2017, I'm not sure I did any in this, in the Willamette Valley. Be, again, because we had had that rain, I was a little bit concerned. So what we're looking for with whole cluster is that, um, you know, typically we de-stem all, but with whole cluster, uh, what we're looking for is lignified stems, which means that we've been able to let things hang long enough that we've been able to get phenolic ripeness. Um, by phenolic ripeness, I mean not the maturation of the juice itself, but the phenolics of what will ultimately form the basis of tannin chains, um, which typically come from the skin, the seeds, and if you're using whole cluster, the stems. And I I, I think that rachis or that those stems need to be 
lignified or brown in color in order to give you the type of flavor profile that will be additive rather than detrimental. You don't want green stemmy. Um, so I did a little bit of it in 2017. I did a lot more of it in 2018 and 2019. Um, and I just can't recall if any went into the Willamette Valley. Okay, yeah, perfect, thank you. Yeah, so I'm tasting the wines and, you know, um, if you wanted to participate and, and put your thoughts and, you know, any other questions in the chat, please do so. So for me, um, the fruit is very pure and it is kind of, you know, raspberry, wild berries. Um, there is a little bit of black and red fruit, but it is a very pure style fruit. Um, then for me, you know, the, the oak is totally integrated in this wine. It has a little bit of age but it's still so young, right? And as Jessica was saying, this is the entry level and the entry level is still very youthful, almost five years later. And you get a little bit of savor in it on, on the palate reflecting the age, but you know, still the wine is uh, very fruit forward. Um, yeah, low tannins, very easy to drink, very silky. So really elegant wine. Thank you. I'd love to know some other thoughts if you have any other impressions that you want to throw in the, the chat there. Because I, 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 you know, there because uh, we were talking about the different soil types and because this is a blend, it has three of those soil types in there. So the goal is that it should have some of those different personality types, so to speak, of the bright red fruit that's a little higher toned and then the deeper, darker fruit um, backbone and hopefully a little bit of spice yeah no but the wine is um it's perfect conditions this is around 20 dollars i think it is uh the bottle which is a good price we are waiting the new vintage to come so oh, i think it should be arriving any day because the truck left so i think it should be arriving very shortly yeah that'll be the 2018 yeah so excited to, to taste that and to have that. But yeah, 2017 is, it's beautiful and it, it is drinking really, really well right now. Okay. Thank you. Well, if there are, I don't know if you have any questions. I'm gonna, um, you're welcome to type any questions into the chat or to keep you moving on in time. I'm gonna put my email in the chat, um, but it's also on the, back of your late on the back of your bottle it has our website if you go onto the website and hit the contact us um, button you, it's going to come to me so um, feel free to get in touch if you think of any other questions later Neil will this vintage benefit from further aging I definitely think so um, I uh, I think that the 17 vintage in general um, like I said presents as a little bit of a cooler vintage uh, and I think it will do beautifully, easily, easily. So let me put it this way. We started in 2003. Um, once a year or so, we go through and taste one from each vintage over the course of all of our vintages so that we know whether something's past its peak. Um, there have only been two wines that I can tell you I've thought, mm, this, I wish I would have had this a year ago. So I really believe that the ageability of Willamette Valley Pinot Noir, particularly when vinified in a style that is meant to be a little bit less of a heavy handprint, that is meant to be picked at a time in which you can retain fresh acidity and have a little bit of a lower alcohol style, I believe that the ageability of Willamette Valley Pinot Noir is quite incredible. Yeah, yeah, um, that is great. So we also do have now is new. So one of the higher end wines from Jessica is at the wine shop, you know. So, so uh, we will be adding more and more because every time I taste the wines, I said, oh, this is so great, so incredible. So yeah, Carolina. Oh, Carolina, I totally understand what you're saying about the cola back notes. And I can tell you exactly where that comes from. Um, one of our vineyards, Kalita Vineyards, which if you go on my website under vineyards, I have 30 second videos of drone shots of each of the vineyards. Um, that, so you can look at a video so you can get a sense of that. But that vineyard, 
every single year has cola sarsaparilla notes to it. And that is absolutely in the vineyard. It is absolutely not in what we're doing in the vinification process. It's just inherent in it. Um, and lingering spices. So anyway, my point was a lot of the Kalita vineyard, there's quite a lot of it in this particular uh, wine. Yeah, no, great tasty notes, Carolina. I, I completely agree. Yes, it is a refreshing acidity, but it's not too high. So it is super balanced and well integrated. So yeah, so it's so easy to drink. Yeah, perfect. Perfect wine for Miami. Um, well, so thank you so much, Jessica, for, you know, being with us and sharing a little bit of your wines. Next time you are in Miami, we definitely have to do, you know, a wine tasting of multiple wines and, and um, have you here. So, so very good to have you. That sounds great. Thank you so much for including me. Please email me or reach out if you have, follow us on social. Like I said, we're only 2,500 uh, cases. So that means I do everything. So um, whatever it is, you'll, you'll get to me. So if you have any questions at all, just let me know. Sounds good. All right. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for including me. Of course. Thank Bye you. Bye everyone. Yeah. All right, so now, um, and this was great. I, I love that she came and she, um, you know, taught us uh, a lot. I wrote a page of, you know, notes from her. So that is always a good sign. Uh, and now it is time for us to move to Burgundy, okay? So um, let's see how Bourgogne or Burgundy. So it is exactly the same thing, okay? Just Bourgogne is the French pronunciation, Burgundy is the American or the English pronunciation. They were hoping for us to say Bourgogne, just like we say Bordeaux and we don't translate Bordeaux, uh, but Bourgogne, Burgundy is the same exact region, okay? So Burgundy, it is 30,000 hectares and just a reminder, you know, for the size of Bordeaux that we saw before. So still, you know, um, very small compared to Bordeaux. 60% of Burgundy is white wines, only 29% are red and rosé, and 11% sparkling. Burgundy makes um, a delicious Cremant de Bourgogne, so it is traditional method, just like Champagne with Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and, you know, um, price is much, much cheaper, okay? So uh, Burgundy, cool continental climates, right? We saw that, you know, you were in the middle of France. So, you know, we saw that with Chablis um, a few weeks ago. And yes, region one of Winkler's climate classification, okay? So very similar to uh, Oregon. So region one, a cool climate, but now we are talking a continental climate versus a more maritime one. Soils in Burgundy, limestone and marl. So Burgundy, again, was a big ocean, right? So this whole region in France was covered um, by a warm ocean and dinosaurs and all of that. So we do find, you know, limestone and marl and um, oyster shells and seashells and all of this. Um, vines are on slopes, okay? These slopes are not um, super high in altitude, but between 200 and 500 meters. And then we have 700 um, millimeters of rain per year. So Oregon has more. She said 39 inches, um, which, you know, translate to 900 millimeters of rain, okay? And, but the style is going to be totally different, more mineral, more savory and very high in acid. So let's see if this is the truth because, you know, uh, the last three vintages in Burgundy, so 18, 19, and 20, they are kind of warm. So um, acid tends to be more moderate for this. And then let me show you here on the map. Um, so this is, you know, the whole of uh, Burgundy. So, you know, inside France, we are south of Paris, north of Lyon. And then the region has Chablis in the very north, um, northwest of the region. And then uh, you have here the Côte de Nuit, Côte de Bonne, and Côte Chalonnais, okay? So this wine that we will taste is a Bourgogne Pinot Noir. And to, to tell you about labeling terms, Bourgogne Pinot Noir normally refers to 
fruit can come from anywhere in Burgundy, okay? So if you have a Bourgogne Pinot Noir, fruit can come from anywhere. Uh, but for the specific bottle, it is only coming from the Côte d'Or, so which is this region in here. It is the Côte de Nuit and the Côte de Bonne, which makes the Côte d'Or, okay? So fruit is coming only from here for this specific wine that we are tasting from Burgundy, okay? Chablis, we know, is um, all about Chardonnay. The Macon region is all about Chardonnay as well. So in the Côte Chardonnay, there is some rosé, there is some Pinot Noirs as well, okay? But um, the Golden Slope or the Côte d'Or is uh, where really you have high quality wines. Um, so this Maison Jaffelin, uh, which is the name of the producer, they are a big, small house. So, you know, they are buying uh, grapes, um, but they are still considered to be a very, very small producer. So they have a range of wines from, you know, the, the regional ones to village to premier crew, grand crew. So they have it all. For this class, I chose the Bourgogne Pinot Noir simply because of price point. I wanted to compare an Oregon Pinot and a Burgundian Pinot with the same price point. Because, you know, even knowing that it costs more to import and to transport uh, the Bourgogne Pinot Noir, but just for us to compare and contrast quality across the same price range, okay? So this wine, 100% Pinot Noir. Now, fully distanced. You know, you heard Jessica talking about, you know, using the stamps or using whole cluster only when she has warm vintages and these stamps are fully lignified, meaning they are brown in color, okay? In the case of this wine, there is no stamps in here. They didn't want it. You know, stamps can, um, for some winemakers, can give floral notes, can give spicy notes as well, add tannins, in this case of this wine, they said, okay, we don't need that. Fermentation is in inert vessels as well, okay? So they will do fermentation in stainless steel and aging for uh, 12 months in neutral oak barrels. So the aging from, you know, the Oregon Pinot Noir and the Bourgogne Pinot Noir is again, very similar. The Oregon one has a tiny bit more new oak, whereas in here is all neutral barrels. So barrels that have been used over and over again, and now they do not impart any flavor, they just allow for micro oxygenation. So meaning, you know, some oxygen can get through, that will soften the tannins a little bit, okay? So, you know, 13% ABV, the Oregon one was 13.5, 13.6, and should be very easy to drink and savory, okay? So, if you have the wine, go ahead and taste um, the Chap Les Chapitres de Jaffelin, so the Bourgogne Pinot Noir. So we can see how similar or different it is from the Oregon one. Okay, mm, that's so interesting. So, you know, so the first thing to notice is um, that the, both wines have only medium color, right? So nothing is too dense and you don't have a lot of color. And think again, you know, Pinot Noir has only very thin skins. Now, Neil is saying that there is higher tannins in this wine. And I agree with that. And also, I think you, what you can feel is also they are stringent, right? So, so they are not as polished and beautiful as the Oregon one. So, which is exactly what we expect from, you know, an old world wine, right? So this wine will take longer for it to develop as well. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, you feel this astringency. So what about the acidity? Do you think it is higher acid in this wine or lower? Um, does it make your mouth water more or less? What do you think? Yeah, exactly. So Carolina and you are saying higher acid. Absolutely. You know, you feel the acidity in here. It's, it's higher acid. 
Um, so, so yes, Janelle as well say, says higher acid. Um, so the benefits of having a high acid wine is that, you know, it is great for food pairing, right? Because you're producing saliva and you're getting your palate ready uh, for the next bite. But, you know, during when the wine is young, and this one is a pretty young wine, so what you see is that kind of lacks a little bit of uh, integration. So, you know, the, the tannins are kind of tougher, the, the acid is higher, the fruit is not, you know, just as beautiful and polished as you see with Oregon fruit, right? Um, so, so yes, I think in this case, you know, I think it is a great, great example of an old world wine. I think it is a great example of a Bourgogne Pinot Noir, you know, um, and, and in the same price point, this is what you get for Burgundy, which I think is a good wine, but it's just a totally different palette, right? So um, I think, you know, I'm gonna ask the question and I think I know the answer, which one you prefer. And I think, you know, most of you will say uh, that the Oregon one is, you know, the easier to drink and I agree, but it's because of that. Um, and Neil has a very good question. So he's asking, this is a younger wine than the Oregon, will, would it mellow with age? Absolutely. So what happens with Burgundy with age is that, you know, things get more integrated. So you wouldn't be able to feel, you know, these astringent tannins or the high acidity, um, but also you get some savory notes. So you will never have fruit, um, you know, unless you are in a very good vineyard, in a Grand Cru vineyard, then you have a ton of fruit, um, but you have more savory notes. So think about, mushrooms, think about, you know, wet leaves, earth, um, something like this. Yeah, so Janelle is saying that it is the perfect example of food wine versus aperitif wine. And I 100% agree. So, you know, the Oregon one, you can drink by the pool. You don't need anything with it, right? The wine is the thing. It is the food, right? Um, whereas with the Burgundian one, you're automatically thinking, okay, I need some cheese with this wine, or I need some, you know, beef bourguignon, uh, which is the typical meat dish, is a stewed beef um, that they do with wine sauce and carrots. Um, so yes, yeah, so you're thinking about food simply because it is kind of a stringent. Um, yeah, so Carolina says, Oregon is still here and is drinking beautifully right now. And I, she thinks that the Jefflin will drink well with some time. Yes, I agree. So, so you know, the Jefflin needs time, um, even at this price point. Um, but yes, I, you know, I think it is precisely what you get. And, and it is very old world versus new world, right? So now going back to applying the knowledge that you know we heard from Jessica today and the knowledge that we have from Tehuar in general. So what makes the difference in here? So if both regions have a Wengler one climate classification, they are cool climate. They have you know the same clonal, the, almost the same winemaking as we can see in here. So what making the difference is really the days and hours of sunshine that we are seeing in the Oregon one, right? She says the 2017 is a cold vintage, but when you smell the wine, you smell the sunshine, you smell the long hours of sun, right? Whereas in Burgundy, um, you know, when you smell the wine, you smell other things rather than the wine. You smell savory, you smell damp earth, you know, the wet leaves. It's kind of, um, I don't wanna say musty because I don't mean cork taint, but you know, it is more that kind of wet environment. Think you, you are in the middle of a, you know, a forest, right? Um, and and the, the Oregon is, you know, pure fruit and beautiful fruit. So, so yeah, very interesting one. Um, so, so yeah, any more comments about the wines? Um, any other questions?
Mona is asking if I would say that the organ is higher quality for the price point. Um, I think it is. Since, and, you know, I didn't expect that, Mona, to happen because, you know, as an educator in here, I'm always the neutral, right? I try to, you know, defend both and show um, what both are. But, you know, we see how this uh, wine from Oregon is drinking beautifully. It is, you know, easy to drink. It is well integrated. It's uh, very well made you know, has this very polished tannins, uh, this very pure fruit. So all of this is a sign of quality. Then for Burgundy, on the other hand, um, you know, it is a warm vintage, but the wine is still tough. So, so yes, you need time in bottle, but no one is kind of aging Bourgogne Pinot Noir. You age your Grand Cru, you age your Premier Cru. Bourgogne Pinot Noir is the wine you drink right now, okay? And yes, new uh, Bourgogne is uh, Pinot Noir 100%, okay? They have other um, categories within Burgundy. They have Bourgogne Gamay, which is made with Gamay, the same grape as Beaujolais. Then they have another category called Bourgogne Pastou Grain, which is, you know, a blend of different grapes. Um, but yes, if you see Bourgogne Pinot Noir, this is 100% Bourgogne Pinot Noir, okay? And um, let me check quickly. So, because um, I wanted to, you know, make sure I'm mentioning the price points correctly in here um, for both. And um, yeah, so the the Effil uh, Willamette Valley Pinot Noir 2017 that was twenty eight ninety nine. And, and then the Jaffelin Bourgogne Pinot Noir is um, $26.99. So exactly, you know, there's a difference of $2 between these wines. And um, yeah, I'm Karen saying uh, Jessica was amazing. Thank you so much for including her today. So, so yes, thank you, Karen. I think, you know, six glasses, you're all seeing me all these classes. So sometimes it's, it's great to bring, uh, you know, some new perspective and hear from other people as well so we can learn more. And, you know, since I was uh, adding a new wine to the store from their range and I was talking to all of them, you know, it makes it easier to say, oh, do you want to participate? So, so yeah, um, it was great. Yeah, okay. So um, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so, so Neil is saying, great to hear from the winemaker and Karen is saying that I'm awesome too. Thank you, we are. All... So um, let me stop sharing for a minute. Um, so we do have two more sessions coming up. So uh, we have a session about Sauvignon Blanc, uh, which is the next one in two weeks. And then um, for the last session, um, I will unfortunately have to change the dates because I will be in Bordeaux. So the last session was supposed to be Syrah versus Shiraz on April 27. So I'll have to change the date. I'll let you guys know. Uh, I'll probably do, you know, one week later um, and I'll confirm this with you. But so that means we'll see each other in two weeks for Sauvignon Blanc. And, you know, Sancerre versus New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, it is going to be a great discussion because the styles are so, so different. But, you know, now Sancerre is moving into the direction of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, especially with the warmer climate. Um, and then, yeah, Shiraz versus Syrah, we, we are going to do this later, okay? So, um, yeah, let me know if you have any other comments um, and questions. And um, Janelle is saying Jessica was incredible. You are, you guys are a power team. I love the extra special education in Oregon. Me too, you know, it's always good to learn from someone because uh, even when you know, you don't know, right? Um, okay, so Neil will be in Europe and will miss the Sauvignon Blanc. Okay, Neil, whenever you have a phrase that say, I will be in Europe and you know, the word sadly doesn't belong together, 
So, you know, luckily you'll be in Europe. Um, so that's okay. We will record the webinars and you can always watch later. All right. So um, thank you so much, guys. It is, you know, always a pleasure discussing this kind of very geeky wine themes and, you know, tasting this, this, um, this different wine side by side. It, you know, kind of opens your mind, right? So uh, how is one region so, so different than the other one? Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Enjoy the wines. Let me know the pairings and tastings later and I will see you guys soon in two weeks. All right. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks Mona. Thanks Karen. Yes. Bye new. Bye.